This evening we're going to look at the life of Christ from a secular point of view. If you were to be asked the, the question, did Jesus actually live in secular history, what would your answer be? What proof do you have? And sometimes people are troubled by the fact that, well, I know that the Bible, and believe this, that it is authentic, it has been tested, and that is a reliable source of understanding that Jesus actually lived. He died, he was crucified, and he's raised from the dead on the third day. And the Bible gives evidence for that. It gives eyewitness testimony to that. But that is not enough for people. Some people want to say, well, is there anything outside of the Bible that would indicate that Jesus actually lived. And there are a lot of critics that will say besides Josephus and a few little details that he said, you really don't have anything from secular history. And sometimes that troubles people, but I want you to know that's not the truth. And so when we think about the, the question, did Jesus actually live according to secular history? I would like this evening for a brief few moments to look at the evidence that we have from non-Christian writers about Jesus Christ and to add that to our understanding to realize even secular historians as we'll see even a satirist who spoke in the Greek language, even he talked about Jesus. And I remember seeing the, the, the movie, or the movie, I guess it was the, the idea of, of different deals about uh, Claudius years ago. And Claudius wrote about Jesus very briefly. But even this Roman emperor did, and we're going to see that with the life of Trajan and all of those, some of those emperors will observe the fact that uh, Jesus actually lived. And we're going to see some interesting things about it. So I want us to observe, first of all, Tacitus. In about 116 A.D., he is writing about the time in 64 uh, A.D. when Nero put to death Christians and or blamed them for burning Rome. And it was a six-day burning that took place. And so Tacitus writes about this. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated by their abominations called Christians by the populace. He said, Christus from whom the name had its origin suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius. You'll see, hey, that's, that's what we kind of learned from the of the Bible, at the hands of Pontius Pilate, Platus, or Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome. Now, this is not a biblical source. It's not from the perspective of the Bible. But he goes on to say what they did to the Christians that we know actually happened in history, where they put skins of animals upon the Christians, and then they turned the wild dogs upon them. And as the sun would go down, they would illuminate the bodies of Christians as they were burning and giving light off to the city of Rome as they paid the penalty for Nero's actions. But you'll notice some things here uh, that during the reign of Tiberius, Pontius Pilate is mentioned. You read that in your New Testament. And that was exactly the one before Jesus, that Jesus was, stood before. And we see the events in the Gospels that are talking about, especially John, how that battle of Pontius Pilate dealing with his conscience about things. But what does he mean by a most mischievous superstition your interpretation is good as mine but historians have said he's talking about that superstition that he was raised from the dead there seems to be a reference from that that that's kind of how this group 
got started. And therefore, it was something, it's just a superstition. A non-biblical non writer would say that. Just a superstition that Jesus was raised. And from his perspective, that's all it was. But it broke out not only in Judea, but you wonder why the gospel spread to places like Rome, to where Christians would be living and where Christians would die. It's because of the resurrection. We know that from Scripture. But isn't it interesting that a historian, a Roman historian, he speaks about this Jesus, Christus, the Christ. And I think that is interesting to find out. Pliny the Younger, you said, well, who was the elder? That was his uncle. And he learned a lot from his uncle, the elder. But here he was, a magistrate in Asia Minor. He would write to Trajan, how am I going to deal with these Christians? And he says they are of different sex, they are a different age, they are a different class, and how are we going to deal with them? And he's writing the Roman emperor about this. This is the times of persecution. We read the book of Revelation and see at the end of the, of the first century those things were happening. Well, he writes this. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day. Before it was light. And they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ. As to a God. And bound themselves by a solemn oath not to, any, not to do any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery. Never to falsify the word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up. After which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. What does that tell us? It tells us, uh, it tells us of the practice of Christians, and he's riding back and forth with Trajan, and he said, here's kind of their practice. How should we handle this? And they recognize, yes, these Christians were meeting at a time when maybe it was very more difficult to get a hold of them. I don't know, but they would meet before it was light. Maybe when everybody else is asleep. Times of persecution. And they would sing songs. Alternate verses. And they're singing hymns to the Messiah, Christ. Not as a man, but as a God. And notice how their character was being set forth. They were bound to an oath not to do wicked deeds. They were not to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery. They weren't to falsify the word. Let your word be your bond. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. We, 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 kind of, we can bring Bible behind this. But from a perspective of a magistrate dealing with political things, this is how they looked at it, which I think is interesting. But there's nothing that contradicts what we see in God's word. What was that fixed day? We know what it is. On the first day of the week, saints were gathered together to break bread. I disagree with historians who say, well, they reassemble to partake of food. And they say, well, that is the Lord's Supper. That is the idea, and they'll want to make that the, the, the love feast. And the Bible doesn't indicate that. And what, what would you, how would you look at that if you're interpret uh, Pliny the Younger? Do you have any reference in the Bible where maybe, well, they met, and I got 1 Corinthians 11, that they were to assemble to partake of the Lord's Supper, but they left to reassemble. And some said, well, that was the Lord's Supper. But do we see in Acts, the second chapter, where on this occasion they were involved in, after they became Christians, they were involved in in the temple and they were doing that daily 
And we've already seen that they were breaking bread and prayers, and they continued to be steadfast in that. But what we find is in verse 46, it says they were breaking bread at home. They took their food with gladness and singleness of heart. The Lord's Supper from the perspective of the Bible is never called food. And the Bible speaks about them partaking of food when they went to their homes. So I think this may be an indication that I may be wrong about that because it's what he's writing about. Did they go at night and, and uh, sing songs of praise unto, unto God, worship Jesus Christ and on a, a fixed day and not partake of the Lord's Supper when they gather together? From a biblical perspective, that wouldn't be the case. But how would this fit? They could be leaving and they enjoyed an ordinary meal in their homes. They would come back together again and meet in their homes. I could see that from Acts 2. But isn't it interesting that they've got an issue from a political point of view. They've got to deal with these Christians. And Trajan the emperor is giving advice how to deal with their different numbers. But what we have is evidence from a non-biblical writer about Christ, about the, the character of Christians, about why they're acting the way they did, what they did on indicated a fixed day, first day of the week, and how they were together and they could be in their homes, in which I, it doesn't say it's their homes, but the take of food, it wasn't any sacrifice to idols nor a, a, a special a food for, to the gods. It's just ordinary, innocent kind of food. But they would do that together. And we know from, from Scripture that Christians did that and they had one heart and soul in mind as they rejoiced together. Having a common faith, they could enjoy a common meal together. And that's what they did. But here's Pliny the Younger, and in, in the years of 61 A.D. Uh, 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 to 112 A.D., in the times of, of Trajan. Josephus. Oh, we know Josephus talks about Jesus, but here's a, an interesting uh, writing. Of course, there's a lot of three dots there. It's too big to put on there. But it says, I think you'll get the idea of what he says. About this time there lived Jesus, a wise man from Josephus' point of view. If indeed one ought to call him a man, for he wrought surprising feats. He was the Christ. There's the idea of the Messiah. When Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him did not give up their affection for him. On the third day he appeared, restored to life, and the tribe of Christians has not disappeared. As he writes about how Christianity is spreading. How that is involved in what's it based upon. Again, he's restored to life. He, on the third day, he appeared. Who said that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Timothy? No, Josephus did. A Roman historian. Jewish background. And he writes about this one called the Christ. Who condemned him? Pilate did. And all these things are given from, they, they don't quit having their affection for him. He's, a, he's indeed wise. He wrought special feats. What's that? We would call them miracles in the New Testament. But there are, are surprising feats, Josephus said. Miracles in the New Testament are called wonders. Not just powers and signs, they're called wonders. They create amazement. And Josephus said they're surprising. Yeah, raising people from the dead. All those things, but he recognized that part of the, of the life of Jesus. And recognized his resurrection. Tribe of Christians, that sect. From a Josephus point of view, he said they have not disappeared. And that's kind of remarkable because when people started following the, the leaders of, of, of revolting times and, and uh, leaders that were leading people away, a lot of times they wouldn't last very long. Something different about Christianity. 
And from such writers as this one, we, get, we see an indication about that. To kind of give another, maybe fuller view of Josephus, it reads as follows. At the time that he was a wise man who was called Jesus, his conduct was good and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. His discipleship. They, resorted, they reported that he appeared to them three days after the crucifixion. As I'm putting in what I couldn't put on the, on the board. And that was he was alive accordingly. He was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. That's how another historian reports Josephus is saying. So you can kind of fill in the dots a little bit. But pretty thorough saying, very consistent with what we see in the New Testament. But that's kind of what was indeed written. The Babylonian Talmud. Talmud was a body of work of rabbis and their teaching. And they're dating from 70 A.D. right on up to 500 A.D. But the ones that are closer to 70 to 100 are, are very interesting. And here's, uh, here's one example of that. From a Jewish perspective of just the rabbis. On the eve of the Passover, Yeshua, Yeshua, Joshua. Jesus. He's saying, gee, that's how it would be pronounced. He was hanged. He was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Or uh, to apostasy. Now he said, well, that's a little different from what I read in the Bible, is it? Jesus was crucified. They didn't hang him. Judas hanged himself. That may be our first reaction. But look at Luke 23 and verse 39. From the, the Bible, we read of the two malefactors who were crucified on each side of Jesus. The Holy Spirit says this. One of the malefactors that were hanged railed on him saying, Art not thou the Christ? Save thyself and us. I thought I've seen in pictures three crosses. Here Jesus was crucified between two robbers. The Bible says they were hanged. Not Hanging by the neck, that's what we usually think of the term. They hanged on the cross. Well, I didn't say Jesus did. Paul says he did. Indicates that. Galatians, the third chapter, and verse 13. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For his written, Cursed is everyone, man, or is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And Jesus was hanging on a tree. Became a curse for us. When did Jesus die? Eve of the Passover. We know from biblical scripture, from the Bible, we read that they hasted to take the body down because it was preparing for the Passover. And the Talmud. Here are secular well, rabbis, Jewish people, not, uh, not ready to uphold Christianity. They deny the Messiah. But they wrote about this Jesus. And all that is what we see. But he's going forth to be stoned because he's practiced sorcery. Forty days before that. And I, I don't have something in that time period. But you know, Jews would put people to death by stoning. Jesus was crucified. But doesn't mean that the plan was to kill Jesus by stoning. In fact, in John the 10th chapter, when Jesus is being accused of blasphemy, you'll notice that they want to stone him. 
when he says, I and the Father are one. And you know that they, they accuse Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, practicing sorcery, doing his miracles. And on this occasion, he has done miracles. And he, they said, well, he, said, he said, which of these works do ye stone me? Because in verse 31, the Jews took up stones again to stone him. The Jews answered him, for a good work we, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou being a man makest thyself God. You maketh thyself God. Enticed Israel to fall away from the law of Moses and all the battle with the Jews. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. But you notice from the passages dealing with his trial and crucifixion, they realize we don't have a right to put Jesus to death according to Roman law. You kill him. And that would be crucifixion. But we see here from the Babylonian Talmud, from 70 AD on, during that early time period, this is what is said of Jesus that we have evidence for. And then Lucian. He looks like he's a satirist, doesn't he? That's a fictional picture of him. But I thought he'd give you the idea of maybe what a satirist looked to, to people's fascination. It's interesting what he says. The Christians worship a man to this day. The distinguished personage who introduced their novel rights, living a different life, something we haven't seen before, all those things, and was crucified on that account. It was oppressed on them by their original lawgiver, which would be Jesus Christ, that they are all brothers. From the moment that they are converted, and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. They kind of have interesting rites and practices that are novel, but their master teaches them this sage, teaches them that when they are converted, they are brethren, they are brothers, and they're sisters in Christ. We understand that. We understand uh, that, that communion that we have, the fellowship that we have as brethren. But so delusive. He's making fun of Christianity. He's not trying to uphold it, but he recognizes these facts about it. They worship a man to this day. Distinguished. He wouldn't say he's God. But look what happens when you're converted, your brethren, and you deny the gods of Greece and you worship the crucified sage. What a contrast that would be to show they recognized him as God. They recognized him as who he was. They were worshiping him and denying idolatry. You look at the book of Revelation, you'll find that that was the big test in the first century. The Roman emperors, they wanted to be worshipped as God, Domitian especially. And they would deny that. They would go to their death, but they would worship Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, and live after his laws. These are just a few of those from Greek writers, Roman magistrates, a Jewish historian, one who was indeed a, a, a Roman historian who lived closely to the time of the first century, the, at the latter part, the first century into the second century, that gives us evidence that Jesus actually lived and had his place in history. I want to sum up by looking at the seven points that we've looked at. Non-Christian sources. This is what we can put together from what you've seen this evening. Jesus was a wise man, a sage. They recognized his wisdom. <laughs> Secondly, he was powerful and revered teacher. Pliny, Talmud, and Lucian recognized his power and involved with being a revered teacher, recognized that. He did surprising feats. And as indicates the miraculous deeds attributed 
to Jesus by Josephus and the Talmud. Jesus was crucified in all four of these writers. Recognize that Jesus was crucified. We've, are, uh, we've understand. But even when they say hang, we understand crucifixion. They mention the name Pontius Pilate for whom he was condemned. On the eve of the Passover, just from secular history, Jesus lived. He died. I know under what governor he's dying before. I even know the emperor in the days of Tiberius. I know it was on the eve of the Passover. I read my Bible and I understand that's what the Bible says. And yet, we can just look at these sources. They're not trying to cause Christianity to grow. Lucy makes fun of them. But that's what they admit about Jesus. And these are possible references to the Father's belief in the resurrection. We know from the Bible they definitely convicted of that. That's the basis of our hope. But this uh, superstition, he would call it, I think there's great indication that he's referencing the, the resurrection. But Tacitus and Josephus speak about that. The followers believe that Jesus is Christ, which we understand is the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And Josephus recognized that. And the Christians worship Jesus as God, as we see from Pliny and Lucian. You know that. From the Bible? Yeah. The Bible is pretty clear on those things. But to that, you've seen it from non-Christian sources for Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's where we get our faith. But sometimes I think we need to understand in our days when people are trying to tear down Christianity and they'll make claims that, well, Jesus, you never have any evidence that he ever lived. He's just kind of a mysterious figure. Never lived in secular history. Josephus, Tacitus, Pliny, rebotic teaching of the Babylonian uh, Talmud. They differ. They say he did. And we have evidence. This is just a few of those pieces of evidence that I hope will secure us in dealing with that charge that we can at least be prepared to answer that. But when we think about the New Testament and we see what it says about Jesus' death and his resurrection and what it means to us, we understand from Scripture that indeed Pontius Pilate was there and Jesus did become a curse for us hanging upon the cross. We read the gospel accounts of his trial and his crucifixion and we read of his resurrection and we understand that he died to save us from our sins. He's taking care of that. We're about to sing, why do you wait, dear brother? Why are you waiting? The Savior has made it possible for you to be saved. Paul will take us to the Corinthian letter. And in the 15th chapter, he makes known unto Christians again the gospel. Why? Why do you want to talk to them about Jesus was well, you know, he was crucified, he was buried, he was raised on the third day. We already know that, Paul. The reason Paul does that, the people were denying the resurrection, their own resurrection. And he uses the gospel again, and he tells us that indeed these apostles were eyewitnesses, not only to his death, but idea of his resurrection. And there were 500 brethren, some of them alive at the time Paul wrote, that you could go talk to them. You want evidence? Here's eyewitness testimony. Not that he died on the eve of the Passover. Not that he died before Pontius Pilate. But that he was raised from the dead. And these writers kind of indicate. That's kind of what believers believe. And you know, well, how come could this gospel spread so fast? It's because the resurrection is reality. We ask again, why do you wait? To become a Christian. It may be. I don't want to be persecuted like they were. Granted. I've never been persecuted like this. I never had to die for my faith. We're still here. But we'll be willing to do that. 
because we are convicted of the truth, because death does not conquer us. We're going to overcome death through Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can face anything. And, and, the, and the Word of God prepares us for this. So when you add the secular historians and realize, hey, they have something to say about Jesus. He was a historical figure. We understand what gives us our faith is what Jesus Christ did. And we need to be prepared for that, for even the persecution that comes, because we're, we're victorious over that. And I'm encouraged to see these, these writers, they, they understood Christianity was spread. They haven't deserted Jesus. They're going to keep following. It started in Judea. It's over here in Rome. And Nero's putting them to death. He didn't conquer Christianity. And no, no one will. And that's what we invite you to be a part of. And this evening, if you're not a child of God, we ask for the final third time, why do you wait?